Jason. There's always something new to learn and here in Rogue Kitchen. We learn by playing with our food. It's Rogue Kitchen Live. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Wow, we got a big day today. We have Scott Kirkman's waiting. Uh, he's up in Louisville right now. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, judging for the Great American Beer Fest, even though the festival is not going on. They're still doing the, the, uh, the uh, beer judging there, and Professor Scott Kirkman's is going to talk to us about that. Then we've got Miss Katie Strain again uh, joining us today. She's going to go over a couple of cocktails with us because we're continuing our brunch theme today. So today we're hitting the savory brunch items. We're going to talk a little bit about quiche. I've got one made over here and kind of walk through the uh, through the pie dough a little bit there, <clears throat> or excuse me, through the uh, pastry dough. And then we're going to do some crab cakes Benedict. Yes, crab cakes Benedict. Oh man, it's going to be great. Got a little uh, kitchen hack I want to show. I want to uh, share with you uh, something uh, Jimmy Jimmy told me about a while ago about doing a hollandaise in a jar. But the interesting thing is I didn't have a jar that fit my immersion blender. Um, you do a immersion blender in a jar, pour the butter in. Uh, but I did find um, a vessel that would work. And so I'm going to use a, <clears throat> a little Yeti cup. Um, and it's, as I was thinking through that, I came up with maybe some ways of keeping that sauce hot uh, while I'm blending it. So I'll uh, kind of talk you, talk you through that a little bit there. Um, but I think beyond that, I think uh, we'll go to Professor Scott Kirkman's there. Scott, how are we doing today? Hey, Scott. Hey, hey Jason. Okay. You're over at uh, hey. Brewers Association hey, in Louisville. Guys... Yeah, I'm up at the Brewers Association warehouse in Louisville. Um, you know, we, we normally have this competition, the world's biggest beer competition. We normally have this beer competition all judged downtown in hotels. Um, this year, a little different. We're doing it at the Brewers Association warehouse up here in Louisville, um, and we're we're taking extra precautions. So we're judging with clear face masks, and we have our other mask on all the time. And it's just a really cool experience to see the ingenuity and the desire for the people in this industry to still see this award ceremony go through, to still recognize great brewers, um, and really to to help keep the industry thriving. You know, help keep the industry alive. Um, so we have really distinguished panelists and judges here with us. We, you know, I was judging with some of our advisory board members today, um, and, and we're just really lucky that we're still able to accomplish something here. Um, and it just shows that ingenuity in the, in the world of hospitality. So um, very blessed, very excited to be, to be able to pull this off. Um, and, um, and now I really need some good food to go along with all the beer I just drank. I had six different styles today. <laughs> I had Vienna lagers and Kolsch's and American fruit sour. I had IPAs. I had hazy IPAs. I had some really cool styles to judge. And so, um, so now I need some food. So I'm excited for road picking. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for uh, joining us for a quick minute to tell us everything about the, uh, Great American Beer Fest. So, uh, we'll yeah, let you, know, you go. Jimmy, this year we're judging. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you because that's cool. We're gonna we're judging 8,800 beers between 160 judges this year. So we got a lot of work to do. So what's the math on that? How many how many beers you got? Oh, I think we're losing this connection. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. Yeah, we'll see. You. More than we'll more see than... you later. <laughs> all, all right, right. Very good. well thanks scott for joining us if you can or can't hear us there uh imagine he's... and katie go ahead and say hi to you real quick hey everybody all right uh one technical thing jason uh i think a uh, screen is blurred on your uh, phone sorry about that everyone it's... It's... all right while you're fixing that we got diane hi diane hi, hi carol thanks for joining us we got our biggest fans joining us. There we go. Perfect, Jason. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. So let's let's talk about some crab cakes. <laughs> yeah. So crab cakes. So you know you kind of have, I think, two different types of crab cakes. You know, you've got kind of like the like the Maryland style, right? It's got that breading on the outside. And then you have kind of the another style of crab cakes. I'm not sure exactly what style you call it but it's the one that it's not breaded and uh 
you know, the, the, uh, the uh, binder or the breading for that is actually inside of the crab cake. And, you know, that's the kind we're going to do today. I want to be able to bite into this and, you know, I don't want it to be too chewy or too gummy. And, you know, I don't really want that crispy breading on the outside, right? I want it to, you know, I want it to be kind of nice and, uh, you know, almost melt in your mouth kind of. So um, it's one that's kind of, it's barely held together really with anything um, and stuff. So sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but I got hungry kids here, just came home from school and piano lessons there. So they're kind oh, of that's all right. lurking around the kitchen a little bit here and kind of checking things out. <laughs> what do you need? And now were you the one playing piano for us earlier backstage? Yes, Callie was the one who was playing piano along with her sister earlier. I'm not it's sure exactly what good. she's getting here. What do you What do you need? Okay, bring bring it over here. Um, <clears throat> so, in doing the crab cakes here, uh, what I the type that I like to or the type of crab that I like to use um, is a jumbo lump, okay, or a, a lump lump crab. All right, and the lump crab. Uh, this has got you know some of the uh, um, it's got some of the lump claw meat basically down here in the bottom, and it's kind of has the smaller pieces there too. But, um, I definitely like using the lumpier crab, um, and uh, I actually bought this at uh, bought this at Costco today. So um, I definitely like those like those bigger pieces. Um, you know, one thing would you have to take in, into consideration when dealing with crab is that. Even though it's already packaged, it is pasteurized, it's already cooked for you, um, you really do have to go through and still look for shells. Um, and uh, interesting yep. thing. You always got to pick through there. Yeah, you know, when I used to work in, in restaurants, we actually had a little UV or like, a, no, not a UV, but a blue light. And you, if you spread the crab out on a sheet pan and just put it on the counter and um, shine the uh, blue light over it, the crab shells, the shells uh, would pop out as clear pieces and everything else is bright white. So that's how you could tell, that's how you could pick huh. out the, uh, the uh, crab pieces. But in this case, we don't I have, did not know that. Yeah. Um, I actually first learned that trick by using an Ecolab UV light. <laughs> 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 and, then there, and then we decided to get a black light. So, um, kind of funny there, but uh, so as you're dealing with this, you know, um, sometimes you put it onto a, put it onto a sheet pan and you just kind of sort through the crab meat and you're really looking for those sharper pieces that kind of poke your fingers and that's how you know you're, you're getting all the shells yeah. out. So, uh, if you can kind of see this. Now, I do want to make sure you're not, yeah, we can see pretty good from here. Um, okay. So while, while you're picking through there, though, you want to make yeah. sure that you're not, like, breaking up the lump too much. Like, you pay extra for lump. Yeah, absolutely. And I see so many people in restaurants do this where they they pay extra for lump crab meat, and then they throw it into a mixer and use the mixer to blend their um, uh, crab cake mix. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you just have tiny little shreds. And it's like, well, you, paid all, you could have paid half as much for a lower quality crab, and yep. you wouldn't, you know, if you're going to do that, save some money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and then, um, yeah, then you don't have those nice big lumpy pieces, you know, like this. And, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Jimmy. You just kind of end up with a, 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 a mushier product there. So we're pretty good on some of these on the, on the shelves in here. I haven't really found any. I'm, the thing is, too, is like you're never going to find all the pieces. Either. That's That's the other Thing yeah, and you know, sometimes crab. it's just like a tiny little thing and you kind of feel a like grit in your mouth or something, but yeah. Um you know, one run through is usually pretty good. They're pretty good about getting most of it. Yeah, yeah. And so what I want to do here is oops, I need to get another mixing bowl here really quick. Because we want to make our binder first. And then we want to add our binder um, to our our crab. We want to fold everything together. You know, again, we don't want to stir it vigorously. We don't want to add all the ingredients for our binder in and then try to mix everything. Because again, as Jimmy mentioned, it's just going to over mix everything. And we definitely do not want to do that. So uh, for that yeah. pound of crab meat there, I'm going to take one egg. I'll put that into our, into our mixing bowl here. 
All right, one whole large egg. Shells are coming apart here. And then to that, I'm going to add about a fourth of a cup of mayonnaise. I have all my ingredients, but not my tools. All right, so we'll add some mayonnaise to there, to it, and that adds some moisture. And that also gives something for our breadcrumbs to soak up and kind of provide some structure for us uh, when we okay. go. Forward. Real quick. Yes. Are you a Hellman's or a, a Best Foods? Kind Hellman's. Of Hellman's or Hellman's. I thought they were the same. Uh, I Aren't think it's isn't it like Best like... Foods in the South and Hellman's? I don't know. I I think so. That's, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's a great that's a great point though too. Um, Another mystery. And, and then to that, you can with these kind of crab crab cakes. You know, crab cakes are kind of like potatoes and rice. You know, you. You, you can really add a lot of different flavors. You can add ginger if you want more of like an Asian flavor, maybe a little bit of sesame oil, some soy sauce. Um, you could add some jalapenos. Um, you know, you could add uh, Latin American flavors. You could add Caribbean flavors. Um, so, you know, really just depending on what the theme of the dish is, you can you know, you really add what, whatever you'd like. Um, here I've got some uh, dried basil and oregano. It came from our garden. We dried it last week, and it's now I'm using it today. So uh, we're just going to add a little bit of uh, some fresh dried herb, all right, into there, and we can taste this afterwards and see if we need to add anything else. And then uh, I like to add diced red pepper. Um, this is about one fourth of a, or not? It's actually about one half of a of a bell pepper. There, we'll add just a few few peppers there we, we, that gives us some color and it gives us some some crunch as well and that looks like a pretty small dice right yeah that's definitely that's kind of between a brunoise and a small dice there so it's probably yeah because if you go dice. too big then you'll get like chunks of peppers that are bigger than your crab and like you want your yeah. crab to be the feature of yeah the, absolutely the crab cake uh, and we did get confirmation uh carol thanks carol for looking that up Hellman's and Best are the same. Just depends on where you live. Oh, yeah. Now I think we talked about it before, that. but I prefer QP over anything. You know, a QP would be great in in crab cakes. Definitely, they would definitely be really good. But um, again, we wanted for this particular recipe, we wanted the kind of the hollandaise and the crab to to be all the yep. flavor there. So, and then we're going to add a little bit of lemon juice and add a little bit of moisture. Um, and I'm going to squeeze this, even though this lemon looks like it does not have any seeds in it. Uh, I'm still going to there in there through the, through the strainer here. And we probably do about one teaspoon here of lemon juice. All right. And then I added two teaspoons of breadcrumbs to that. Okay. Here I'm just using like traditional breadcrumbs. Um, you could definitely use panko. Panko is going to offer a little bit more of a lighter kind of airier uh, texture in there. Um, but uh, your breadcrumbs, again, since we're not putting them on the outside, we're putting them on the inside there. I'm just using traditional breadcrumbs there. So we'll add all that. Yeah, and like you said earlier, doing all this beforehand, getting it all mixed together, yeah. so that way you don't have to mix the uh, crab too much. And there, it kind of looks more like, kind of, kind of like a mayonnaise, really, is what, is what, well, it is. I mean, there's mostly mayonnaise in there, but there's also the egg. <laughs> really kind of looks like a remoulade, then, I guess, just a, a, a thin, a thin, Remoulade there is our binder. Okay, so now we'll pour that into our crab here. Make sure we want to get all that mixture into there. So we want to, our crab sticks together. And some of these might fall apart too. Again, this is a very delicate crab cake. Um, but it's definitely one that will be very good with the egg and the that uh, heavy hollandaise we're going to do later on. Okay, so we've got that all mixed in. I'll steer it up here, as my grandma used to say. Yep, and you're kind of folding like you would with a mousse or souffle or something. Kind of, just kind of like the edge of this. Scoop it. Yep. Coming up through the middle there. You know, you could definitely let these sit for you know about half of an hour in the refrigerator get all that breadcrumb, you know, to soak everything up. Um, but we're just going to, uh, we'll start forming them here. I think Miss Katie's going to talk to us about our, uh, our 
beverages today. All right, yeah. So while you're making those crab cakes, Katie, let's hear about oh, these. Sure. Uh, bloody, yeah, okay. You got all the mixings for bloodies, I think, I'll right? I'll stand up. I do. I have a little bit of everything. Hold on, my headphones get out. Okay, so I figured you can't do a savory brunch without a good Bloody Mary. Um, and since, you know, we're all about beer in the beer industry program, I'm going to make a Guinness Bloody Mary. And so, um, Bloody Marys are great because it's kind of everything but the kitchen sink kind of an idea, especially when you're picking out your, uh, your garnishes and stuff. So I will just go ahead and get started. Um, just got my normal cup. I don't like salting the rim for my Bloody Marys, but if you do go ahead and salt your cup and then make your Bloody Mary in another cup and then pour it in there. Um, but to now, if you do salt it, do you just do regular salt or um, well, yeah, I've seen some places do like Old Bay. Yeah, I think you can totally, yeah, go get experimental with it for sure. Um, like, I like, I like salt on my margarita, but for some reason I just don't. I think, I don't know, Bloody Marys are salty enough or something. I don't know why I don't like it, but sorry, my ice melted, so I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, you don't want any extra water in there. No. <laughs> That would be silly. Okay. And also my refrigerator makes like the worst ice cubes ever. Um, okay, so got some ice. And then you do two ounces of vodka. All right, now what vodka are you using? I see the Kirkland brand oh, on yeah. there. Oh yeah, this is just the good stuff from Costco, absolutely. That's, that's, hey, that's perfect. Vodka, actually. Um, actually, Breckenridge makes a really good chili vodka that usually I use for Bloody Marys, but I just came across this mix and it's really spicy, so I didn't think that um, the Bloody Mary needed any extra spice. But I got this one because I don't like a lot of horseradish in my Bloody Mary mix, and this one, it just has a little bit of horseradish power powder, and it's like the last ingredient on the list. So I figured I was safe there. Plus, it's uh, local. So I'm gonna say it looks local. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, made in Silverthorn. So there you go. So I'm just gonna sweet. Shake What's this the brand up on that? Bit. Um, Tree Line it's Pike's Pepper. I think this is the spiciest one they have. But uh, yeah, it was. I tried it yesterday. Got to give it a good shake, and then. Pour it in, not all the way up, because you got to save a little bit of room for the Guinness. And I like adding Guinness because it just kind of mellows it out a little bit and gives it kind of a round, a uh, little bit of roastiness. So um, it's pretty yummy. So about maybe an ounce and a half of the Guinness there. Plus, I just think people get excited when they hear Guinness, anything, right? Um, yeah. So I, I do like... A couple drops of liquid smoke. It doesn't, like, three drops is not enough really to taste it, but you kind of taste it, if that makes any sense at all. It kind of gives you that mouthfeel. Yeah. Know, kind of. So I'm just going to mix it up. And again, if you do like a salted rim, do this part in another cup and then pour it into your salted rim cup. It'll just look much nicer. Um, and then go ahead and garnish. And I, Bloody Marys are awesome because you can garnish with kind of whatever you have. So um, celery is always good because I think like it serves as a stirrer too, is like while you're drinking it. Um, I have some pickled asparagus. Um, so I'll throw that in there. Come here. Now, now Jeff thought we were going a little light on the vodka. <laughs> Jeff Rice up out there. <laughs> Um, but then he saw you pour in the Guinness, and that, okay. that definitely makes okay. up for it. Okay, all right, yeah. I don't want him to think I'm like a Bloody Mary sissy. Um, okay, and I got some blue cheese olives. Come here, you. Ooh, that sounds good. Ooh. Yeah, except... Those are I, delicious. I, I swear I washed my hands. I got some pickled okay. green beans in my fridge. Ooh, yeah. There you go. <clears throat> Should have sent those down to you. Got some tomatoes from my garden, and then this is like a three cheese pepper jack, super good. Um, Ooh, nice! But I mean, you can add anything to Bloody Marys. People add bacon or beef jerky. Um, 
or a shrimp little, cocktail. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like everything. So there you the go. Hotel I mean, probably down in Buena Vista. a little high, but. Ooh, there you go. Oh, my gosh. The surf it's hotel so down good. in Buena Vista. It's so spicy. <laughs> with there. It's, it's pretty good. It's the perfect amount of spice. I really do like it. And like I said, the Guinness does kind of tame a little bit of the acidity and the spice. Um, yeah, it's just delicious. Nice. Um, awesome. Yeah. So we can go. Okay. Now, so you can substitute any beer for that, right? Like, well, any yeah, stout. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anything, yeah, with those kind of dark, roasty flavors. Um, I think they just add a little something. I think you could also go light beer if you wanted to throw like a yeah. Miller Light in there and it would kind of be like a red beer. Those are really popular in Nebraska. People just add tomato juice to their beer. Um, so it kind of be like that. So, yeah, it depends on what kind of flavor profile you're going for. Um, but yeah, I guess I like my Bloody Mary. It's just kind of rich and ah, so good. Yeah, I like the stout because it kind of gives it like just those roasty flavors, like you said, and yeah. some depth in there. So this yeah. one, um, uh, but I do, I do enjoy my red beers. Yes, yeah. I mean, you have to. It's a hangover cure, right? Um, <laughs> so this one though, I probably would be better to serve before or drink while you're making the crab cakes. Uh, but there's a lot of flavor here, and you don't want to overwhelm those delicious crab cakes. So I chose another cocktail to enjoy while you're eating your crab cakes, and that is a beer. So I'm gonna. Here we go. Ooh, nice. Um, so I also have, have a virgin, um, virgin version of it also for those that don't want alcohol. So we'll start with that one first. Um, and you can use like any soda, but I like. This is just cream soda, and then it kind of tastes like a creamsicle. Sorry, my head's missing. Um, so, and I would make the virgin one in a different cup, just so there's no confusion there. So, I'm just going to, you know, add your soda. And then just a splash of orange juice is all you need. Wah. There we go. And got some orange garnish. So, that's kind of cute for the kids, and then... Or if you don't want alcohol, too. Um, just yeah. another option for them to have. And then for the beer mosa. So, sorry, my dog's barking, of course. She's been quiet the it's whole time. Because he wants, <laughs> he wants a Bloody Mary. Yeah. So for the beer mosa, um, I've made this with, like, a you could do it with, like, a German or Belgian-style Hefeweizen or Weiss beer. And that's going to add a little bit more of like a banana flavor and some spices like clove or coriander um, kind of flavors like that. For the crab cake, though, I thought it might be better to go with an American wheat. Um, these don't have as many of those um, kind of spicy and super fruity flavors. So this one's a little bit cleaner, and I thought that would just be better to go for the beer mosa. So um, give it a shot. I do love that beer. Oberon is delicious. Oh man, you can't go wrong. So pour it down. I think I was telling you earlier they had a uh, kegs of those mini kegs at Costco. Yeah. I, all of my neighborhood friends, we got like three or four of them and drank them for the last couple months. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. All right. Well, and it's good to get those kegs because there's an aluminum can shortage. So by buying kegs, you're you're helping. Hmm. Um, oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I was just talking to Tivoli today, and they, they're they seven weeks out on getting their next can shipment in. So, Because um, oh, wow. they're just with all the restaurants and bars not being open as long, there's not as many kegs being bought. Everybody's trying to can, and there's just not enough cans to go around right now. So yeah. I'm going to add a little bit of orange juice, and then I throw a little bit of Cook's in there. Just gives it a, like a little bit more spritziness, I think. Um, this is the Cook's Brut, but I think you could do anything. Brut, brut's not like completely dry, but mostly dry. Um, again, it's kind of like whatever sounds good. And then I've got some orange bitters. I'm just going to add like a drop or two. Or I don't know, whatever that is. Three or four. <laughs> is that the strong water orange bitters? What is this? Yeah, it is. Nice. Oh, I have that water's stuff up in my, good. in my bar. Yeah, this, strong waters is delicious. Yeah. Uh, if delicious. anybody out there likes, uh, bitters you can get the little sample pack of those um uh, it's like four or five of them from yeah. uh i think they have it at molly's or any of the major liquor stores <clears throat> molly's does have them, yeah. 
Sure. It had like a like a four yeah like a five pack or something like that. Um, nice. And then I'm gonna use this end because the, the other end has like Bloody Mary stuff all over it. Um, and then for I tried to make really cute orange peel curly cues, but they didn't turn out. But I'm gonna throw it on there anyway. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> you know you could also go like full on orange peel, but. Um, Oh, that's good. Um, nice. Yeah, actually, I think that would go really, really well with the crab cakes. I'm imagining what they're going to taste like. But, um, you know, when you're <laughs> when you're pairing a cocktail, you just got to try to match intensity so one doesn't overpower the other one. So that's why, um, yeah, I think the beer mosa would be better for eating or drinking with your meal. Um, but it's always good to cook while you're drinking a Bloody Mary, too, so... Awesome. Uh, I think that's it. Well, me. <clears throat> cool. Jason, Cheers. are you uh you know, ready for those crab cakes? Yeah, Katie, thank you very much. Uh, oh, I'm my enjoying pleasure. the uh I'm enjoying the uh the uh, Guinness Bloody Mary over here, although I don't have the vodka in it, but I'll <laughs> try one this weekend. <laughs> more Guinness. Stuff. <clears throat> but either well, way, Jeff like... Jeff Rice might shame you for not having any in there. Oh, well, you know, he, he knows I'm a bourbon whiskey guy, though, or a whiskey bourbon. Um, all right. On that note, have you ever had a have you ever had a bloody with a uh, with bourbon in it instead? I, there's a name for it. I can't think of it right no, now. No, I have not. But that's actually quite that's actually really good, too. Yeah. That sounds delicious. I've heard of tequila, too. too. You can use tequila to make a Bloody Mary. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Cool. They're all good. But, all um, right. All right, yeah, those uh, crab cakes look good. Yeah, so what I've done here is, uh, um, of course, you know, being in the being in the hospitality and restaurant profession, I tend to have tools that are, you know, that you would see in the industry in my own home. And so, you know, I use this guy here to, uh, uh, let's see, what is this, a number? I can't remember. Say what number is that? Yeah, it's a red handle there, Jimmy. Uh I can't remember what it should be what, like a three, something like that. Yeah. Or no, no, it's like no, it's a five, I think. Is it? Uh, it says three forty-two on it, so I don't. Uh, oh, there it is. Nope. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> they look usually like there's a number on there. You yeah, know, usually uh, there's a number, and check on the yeah. thumb, but yeah, I think uh, right that, there that's number twenty-four there. So, um, but either way, you know, we call them scoops. Uh, in the restaurant industry, and uh, one of our instructors told me that uh, when when she was working for the university or working for the food service for the uh, university, um, they call them dishers. And if you believe it or not, when you try to order them, you have to look up dishers. So interesting. Anyway, um, so I used that ice cream disher, that food disher there. Uh, I put two of those together to make um, one large cake here. And, and uh, again, these things are so incredibly delicate. Um, but uh, I've got my pan hot back here. I've got a nonstick pan about medium heat here. And I'm going to turn my my egg poaching liquid down here in the back. Uh, I'm going to sear up all four of these at the same time. I'll just get a generous amount of oil in here. All right. And we'll just put our crab cakes straight in to our pan. And uh, I've got a one of one of my again another favorite kitchen tool um when you work a saute station in the kitchen it's probably the most coveted kitchen tool other than a great saute or a great french steel pan uh but this is a fish slice and it's it's a thin, oh, yeah. thin metal spatula with uh with uh, large grooves here in it and um yeah when you work in a kitchen man you almost have to have this thing strapped to your hip it will disappear. People <laughs> like these things yeah. a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, if it's outside of hand's reach, someone might swipe it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, and uh, I'm going to turn the heat up here just a bit. All right. So we want a nice golden brown color on this. Okay. Well, as soon as I flip these over, you'll see what I mean. Um, so while those are searing here, I'm going to talk about the my poaching water back over here. Uh, I've got maybe about a quart and a half of water and about uh, about a half of a cup of vinegar, right? A lot of times when you poach eggs, you pour the vinegar in. Then 
We lost you on the computer. We'll just sit here and watch your crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, while Jason, good. I was gonna say, how's that, uh, that beer mosa going? It's delicious. Um, sorry, I can't not drink it with it sitting right in front uh, of me. I, I don't blame you. I, I'm <laughs> half tempted if Jason gets back on here to go make my own. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, um, I just made one. I was kind of testing out proportions last night. And so I, I didn't have any bells over on, but I did have a Tiffoli Mile High Hef. Um, and that okay. one's got more of the banana and clove flavor, so I wasn't sure how, how it would go with the crab cakes. But um, if you're looking for another beer that would make a really good beer masa, that definitely is one of them. Uh, it nice. was delicious. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. Am I, am I All right. Back? Well, Jason, you back? I think, yes, I think we I think got so. you back. <laughs> Sorry, my Skype All right. just unexpectedly <laughs> quit there. I'm having some issues with Skype on my devices today. I don't know what's going on. All right, so now we'll flip these hey, guys it would, over. It wouldn't be a Facebook Live Rogue Kitchen if we didn't have some sort of technical difficulty. I know, right? <laughs> Jeez. So now we've got this nice golden brown crust on there. Oh, man, Ooh. look how good that looks. Oh, nice. All right. And see our crab cakes are not falling apart here. Okay. And... Yeah, and see how Jason's being super gentle with that and just kind of flipping it onto his hand. Yeah. Except that one. Except the last one. Except the last one. <laughs> the last one I kind of showed what you know you might might do if you get that heat hurts oh. a little bit there, you know. But uh, yeah, after you do one or two, you can kind of see how firm it is and if it needs to be um, yeah. handled that gently or not. All right, so from here, we're just going to pop these guys straight into the oven. All right, and while we make our finish in there, our hollandaise, then they'll go in there for about fifteen minutes. Okay, we want to make sure that. Those, those were kind of thick crab cakes, right? So, um, you know, we would definitely want yeah, to. You want to make sure that egg sets inside, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll take we'll take a temperature of that here in just a little bit. But, um, so anyway, the water back over here. So like I said, I've got about a quart and a half of water, uh, about half a cup of vinegar. The vinegar helps um, coagulate the egg whites, okay? Um, but another, I'll, I'll show you another interesting uh, kind of technique on keeping that, keeping that egg all nice. Nice and tucked together and whatnot. So, uh, in the meantime, though, I'm going to uh, go ahead and melt our butter here for our hollandaise. And so, what that'll that will do is we'll melt our butter. And we'll, um, essentially, essentially, we will be making clarified butter because we only want to use um, the melted butter. We want to discard the milk solids, Keep, yep. keeping the butter fat, discarding the milk solids. All right, um, in there, and um, you can definitely buy clarified butter. Um, but again, it's you know it's not that hard to, to really make your own. Um, and no I've question got... for you. Yes. Real quick, so I'm not positive the answer to this, but can you just substitute ghee if you have ghee, which is clarified butter? I don't see why not, because it comes from cows too, right? I mean. It's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm... Just yeah, thinking in my head, why, why have I why, why have I why been using there, butter when I have ghee? Well, why is there a difference between ghee and and butter, and why is ghee so expensive in the grocery store? I don't know, but <clears throat> interesting there. Um, again, there's always something new to learn. Maybe we'll try to uh, bring that up in a topic at some point. But, I'll, I'll test uh, it out. I'll do some uh, hollandaise with ghee. All right, sounds good. Sounds good. So. When you're melting butter to get clarified, uh, you want to try not to boil your butter. Um, if you boil your butter, you essentially don't get clarified butter. You just get melted butter. All right, we want that clarified. Although I know a lot of hollandaise recipes will just have melted butter in it, um, which is totally cool. But, um, so that's melted. Let's give the uh, milk solids a chance to kind of um, separate there. And in the meantime, so I'm going to make a one egg hollandaise. I'm going to try to make a one egg hollandaise in a Yeti cup. <clears throat> now what I've done is because of, you know, the way Yetis are designed, they have that air pocket, right? So they trap that heat or cold, whatever you're putting into there. They trap it really well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I put boiling hot water in here um, to kind of heat up that space. All right. And I'm going to add my lemon, wherever that, there it is. All right. Uh, We'll add about a teaspoon or two here of 
um, of lemon here, and I might need to handle. We don't need too much more. We don't really want a lot in our hollandaise. We don't want it to be incredibly zingy, right? Um, and then I'll separate. Yeah, sometimes it's too much. Yeah. I'll separate the egg and the trick. Uh, you guys can see this over here in that camera phone. Maybe not, but um, I like to crack the egg. I, I just use my hand, um, but I like to crack the egg and just let the white fall between between my fingers there and that separates the yolk quite easily yep and that definitely works pretty well so we'll just put that in there and we'll uh, discard our egg white unless you like to keep egg whites um you know, in case you like i mean if you're making like, rings or something i don't know <laughs> but yeah if you're making a large batch of hollandaise and you have a bunch of whites then go ahead and save them but yeah. if it's just one I mean, you could always add it to like an omelet or something if you're making omelets or scrambled eggs. Sure. Now, this particular recipe is just a—it's just an easy um, lemon and egg, all right, with melted butter in there. Um, you know, traditionally, one you could do like a black pepper, a peppercorn, um, and vinegar, uh, vinegar reduction. Um, but we're going to just do uh, straight lemon juice and egg in there. All right. So now we've got our our uh, butter's melted here and clarified, so I'm just going to pour this until I get it to the egg or to the uh, butter solids. All right, so we'll just start spinning this here a little bit with our emulsion blender and uh, we'll slowly emulsify our hot butter into our egg here. Get a little bit going in there. And we'll see how this guy turns out. And yeah, now we've got some spinning going on there. All right, and the thing with uh, emulsions is that you want to you want to spin it really fast and pour really slow. It gives the fat globules a chance to disperse evenly. If you pour everything together too fast, right? Then you kind of in inundate the egg yolk, and you can end up with a separated. Hollandaise, definitely not what you want. So we just pour slowly, mix really fast. All right. And we've got the milk solid there. Now we'll see if this thing holds together here. All right, did you get a decent emulsification? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, like in this quick hollandaise, it's no like pro hollandaise. You definitely want to make and use it up real quick. Like, yeah, definitely. Um, we'll it's look. not something you're gonna make and hold on a kitchen line for four hours. Yeah, definitely not. Uh, we'll add some seasoning here to it. It's a little thin today, but um, yeah, it's quite thin. That's okay. There's always a way to fix that too. Um, I'm going to add maybe another egg to it or something. Let me try that really quick here. Let me grab another one of these containers. Uh, when you fix an emulsification, this, this this isn't broken, but what it is, it's it's kind of thin. And I want it a little bit thicker. Hollandaise should be a little bit thicker, almost like uh, like slightly whipped cream, you know? Like, um, yeah. You want it to be... Almost light and fluffy. Yeah, light and fluffy, exactly. So um, we'll uh, add another egg yolk here and uh, we'll help with that. Uh, but you can do the same thing then if your hollandaise breaks. You can always add um, another egg yolk to it there and just take a little bit of the um, emulsification that you already have and just pour that down in there. We'll get this guy going here, and then we'll uh, slowly pour this in and see if we can get a little bit thicker product here. And you know, the Yetis, they don't pour that well. Yeah. We'll uh, get the most part here a little bit more. There we go. It's a little bit thicker there, so we'll... <clears throat> All right. And 
Just, there we go. That sounds better. Sounds you, a you can better. hear it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. It's a little go. bit better. Nice. It'll definitely be uh, thicker there for us. So, all right. Cool. Side here. Moving on to that Bloody Mary there, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just sitting here. Oops. Sorry about my dog. Okay. So now we'll get to uh, poaching our eggs. We'll, we will uh, pull our um, crab cakes out of the oven. Finish up our dish here. I mean, again, it's definitely a little bit, still not quite as thick as I'd like it, but um, I'm sure does taste. Yeah, and you, taste. you definitely want to keep an eye on those crab cakes because um, for you <clears throat> out there who might try this recipe, if you, if you go too long, they'll start to dry out a little bit. Yeah. Um, you still want it to have some moisture in there, so that way when you when it breaks apart, it still just kind of has that yeah. juicy crab. If you let it go for too long, that uh, crab juice will just kind of cook off. Yeah, definitely. You, know, you definitely don't want dry crab cakes either. So, okay. So on this. All right. So poaching egg time, right? Yeah, poaching egg here. So we're just gonna kind of stir our water to kind of create a vortex in the middle here. And what I like to do is actually I didn't have this ready to go here. I like to crack my egg into a container because so, we don't want any eggshell going into our into our water. All right, and you want kind of yeah, like it's no fun getting it out if it does fall in there. Yeah, no kidding, that's no fun at all. But you definitely want a uh, a light simmer on here, so you don't want the water fully boiling because then your egg white will come apart. But you want a little bit of movement in your water, but you just pour that egg straight in the middle of that vortex there. Yeah, and so that kind of wraps the egg whites that do cook around themselves. So it kind of like swirls all the whites together. And as you can see here, whoop, yeah, that's nice and compact like that. It swirls everything together. down a little more. Tilt down, tilt down a little. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Nice and nicely done. That looks great. The egg white is nicely wrapped around the yolk. You don't, you don't have a long tail on it. Just kind of manage your heat a little bit there. All right. Sorry, folks, we're kind of dealing with some adaptations here on some equipment. But <laughs> hey, it, it works. We're, it works. We're doing good. That's right. And so we want to poach this for maybe about 90 seconds. Um, you, know, you can go about two minutes if you want a little bit more of your yolk to be a, a little bit more firm there. But I'll go ahead yeah, and say I'm usually our... a little closer to I like my yolk to be like be kind of gel. Gel, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I just I can't stand when the whites aren't cooked all the way, and it just I know. yeah. <laughs> all right, so we'll grab one of our crab cakes here, put that in the middle of our plate. All right, so see we're. Not spongy, but it's nice and soft and supple there. All right. Now, <clears throat> I like to keep a plate with a paper towel on it, and we can kind of transfer the eggs straight to there. That way, we're not dribbling water all over our plate there. So. Yeah, yeah, that's it's never good, too. And then we'll gather our egg. The slotted spoon is good to use. Drop that guy straight onto our paper towel, let it drain a little bit. You can see how the the yolk is still kind of bouncy. It's not hard, but it's not falling apart. So it's thoroughly cooked. Just take a little tail here, wrap it around there like so, put our crab cake straight on. Like so just dab it a little bit here, keep that extra moisture off there. Then we'll grab our our Yeti uh, our quick hollandaise. Our Yeti hollandaise. Scoop it back right on top. Actually, doesn't look too bad. Yeah, that looks pretty good from here. Could be a little bit thicker, I think. Definitely could be thicker. And we'll just take a little bit of our some fresh herb here, put it on there. A few of our red peppers here some, for some color. 
in so the cayenne i like to use like a smoked paprika and chili powder mix take some of that and we'll just sprinkle it right on and uh, wait oh and there we've got can you rotate for me real quick there we go there we go oh crab cake oh no, that still looks good rotate the other way <laughs> like that oh there we go yeah nice yeah, that looks that's great yeah that holiday looks looks pretty good okay now we'll take our uh, a fork here and yeah. we'll gotta get this check out that yoke ready oh there it is look at that uh you're making me so hungry this is ridiculous <laughs> jason needs to carry out after these things there you I go know. Hey, I'll, I'll be down. Wait, you're like a half hour away from me. He's only like five <laughs> minutes away from me, so that's, it's tempting. <laughs> I know there's four, four or three more crab cakes in there. <laughs> yeah, right? And I've got some more mix in there, too. So I'll be down on campus tomorrow. But, uh, well, that was so beautiful. Jennifer, Jennifer says uh, you need to teach her how to keep her workspace that clean. <laughs> I must say, you, are, you, you work very clean. Oh, thanks. So be sure to tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, you listening? All right. The now phone's what, not going now in we, here for some reason. We, we so can't I'm see gonna... around the kitchen. All we see is this frame right here. So who knows what's on the other sides? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So I, I've turned off the phone there, Jimmy. I mean, it's not okay. That's fine. Staying in this holder very well, but um, so there, there's that. And then uh, you know, I just kind of want to talk about the quiche here a little bit we're short on time but, uh, uh, we're gonna, you know peace is one of those jason your audio is breaking up just a little bit why don't you just oh, pause and uh, go with your computer all right can you hear me okay yeah yeah okay yep you know quiche is one of those things where it's you know you can buy a pie crust um we posted a great a a, a great recipe online it's Oh, now we lost your audio completely, Jace. Jason, can you hear us? He can't hear us. <laughs> hey, Jason. There we go. Can you hear me okay? You, we, we, yeah, we just lost your audio for a minute there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to use the mic here on the computer, but... Um, no, that's, okay. no, that's okay. I think that's much better. Okay. Uh, but uh, the recipe is labeled as a pate rose, which means um, basically it has less sugar in it than like a sweet crust. So you have pate rose and a pate sucre. Right? They're basically the exact same thing. Um, just a pate sucre has powdered sugar in it. Um, uh, which makes the crust much more flaky because of uh, the sugar content it's in. But something like a quiche, because it's savory, all right, uh, we want less sugar in it, all right? And, um, and uh, you know, it still gets, it still has nice flakiness to it again because it has the butter in there, all right? Uh, but we use, we use pastry flour in here um, because, you know, it, it doesn't it provide still a flaky crust. It's not as hard and crunchy. Um, if you would use like an all purpose flour. Or so, um, but uh, I did that crust in a food processor, chilled it down, rolled it out, and then in my, in my filling in here, um, you know, quiche is one of those things again where it's, you know, your filling doesn't really kind of change as far as the egg to, to, to dairy ratio, right? But this particular, particular recipe has heavy cream in it, um, which again, adding that, that fat content to it makes it for a richer flavor um, and your egg product isn't so, it doesn't taste like scrambled eggs. It's more, you know, it's more fluffy and creamy. Uh, when you might cook. Actually, it actually cooks a shorter amount, in a shorter amount of time than if you were just uh, your uh, whole milk or skim milk. All right, hey, hey Jason, uh, we're kind of losing your audio in and out still, so. Um, no, that's right. Uh, but I think, uh, 
Yeah, you know, we could talk a little bit about the quiche. We'll post the recipe for the quiche and uh, uh, some few comments and stuff. If you want to cut it up and show us real quick. Yeah, sure. Hey, I have a question. And oh, well, yeah, no, go ahead, Katie. Well, so if you were going to make a quiche and not make the crust like I would do, where can you buy pre made like pastry dough like that? Or would you just use a pie crust and. Yeah, you can just use pie crust. Yes, yeah. So at the store, you can buy like the canned pie crust, um, and that works perfectly fine. Oh, okay. uh, you can also you can find some um, frozen pie crusts that aren't sweet. Oh, okay. Um, and sometimes you can find those in uh, frozen, and they're kind of like the uh, puff pastry where you kind of unroll it. Um, but honestly, the Pillsbury can pie crust is not that bad for those of you that don't want to make the pie crust um and it's kathy uh you asked where we could find all the recipes uh we actually we are working on getting a website up on our uh, school of hospitality website or at least a page there uh, where we'll host all of the recipes that we have done and the future recipes that will be coming up um yeah and jennifer says she vouches for the pillsbury on this one yeah it's it works great um, especially if you don't want to sit there and make pie crust all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, Laura Limpy, we'll get the uh, uh, the recipe posted. Um, it should be, we'll get it somewhere on here. I'm working with Mackenzie to get that posted for us. So, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, and, uh, so continuing on the uh, the Pillsbury. Uh, Jennifer says that it goes on sale for a dollar a box sometimes too. So keep an eye out for it and then stock <laughs> the right. freezer. <laughs> That's good. Um, or, you know, if you don't want to do the pie crust, um, you can do what's more of a frittata. Um, and you kind of cook it a little bit, let it set, but then let it finish in the oven. Um, you could also do what's called a strata. Um, and I used to have to make this at the bakery I used to work at up in Greeley every single day at five in the morning. Um, but it's, you basically you whip your eggs. Uh, sometimes people put, uh, like chunks of, uh, white bread in there. Um, and it just kind of helps fluff it up. Uh, but same thing, you can put any filling you want in there. So, so Jason looks like you're putting some, uh, some pesto on there. Yeah. I didn't quite catch what the filling was in there. Oh yeah. So the filling in there. Yeah. All right. We still can't hear you. So, um, and yes, Jennifer also mentioned too, and I've done this before, uh, where you do uh, potatoes in the bottom of your frittata. So you like, you actually kind of cook the potatoes and you saute them so they start to cook up. Um, and then you pour your egg mixture with all the fillings over there and it kind of settles into it. Um, and then you put, you finish that in the oven. Um, and then when you, you flip that onto a plate and then you have all the potatoes like Ooh. nice and crisp on top and you cut into it and the egg is all kind of mixed in there. That's delicious. Um, yeah. It's called a Spanish tortilla. Um, and and actually, on the note of that, tortilla too. You could also throw a tortilla in the bottom. Um, throw some green chilies and some sausage in there and have a uh, southwestern frittata type thing. So, Ooh. all right. Can you hear me at all? Jason. Hey, there you are. We okay. got you. Yeah, my microphone was turned down. I don't know. But anyway, the... Yeah, so the, the fillings for this particular quiche that I have, um, I've got three different types of salumis in there. I've got um, a prosciutto, salami, and a capicolo, which is kind of like a spicy Italian ham. Um, and uh, you can also get capicolo without pimento or um, pimentides in it. And so um, got those chopped up with some goat cheese and sauteed mushrooms. You know, one thing when you're dealing with oh, nice. with um, when you're dealing with quiches, you want to try to cook all the ingredients that you're putting into it because um, you know if you just put raw mushrooms, raw spinach, and raw bell peppers in there, you have all that moisture that's in there, and that's really going to throw off your ratio of eggs of your eggs and cream in there. Um, yeah. And then it'll it'll never set. Um, it puffs up really big, and then when it is done, you take it out of the oven, it's collapsed, and it's just yeah. It, really chewy then you have pockets of like soggy vegetable juice and yeah. yeah so you you really want to cook your vegetables and make sure you're getting all that liquid out and then 
then add that goat cheese like you did or any sort of like cream cheese sometimes um or uh creme like top it with creme fraiche or i've done a ah, can't think of it mascarpone Oscar. before yeah. yep yeah and you can like i i always have a bottle of pesto again it's a uh costco brand pesto but this uh, this stuff is great um you can tell we all love costco around here <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can see my my container of ghee over here on my counter. <laughs> yeah, I put that on top of yeah. it, and um, you know, uh, kind of spread that around on top, and it, it makes for a great um, rupper, supper and breakfast. Um, <laughs> or, uh, or again, you know, makes for a great brunch um, item. And you, you know, you can you know, if you buy the uh, uh, you know if you buy the pre-made crust. You make two quiches with eight eggs and four eggs per thrust with one cup of dairy. So half a cup of cream and a half a cup of milk and you get the squeeze in there. Um, yeah. And you just add. Yeah, and then you throw one of those in the freezer. Yeah, exactly. You throw it in and, you know, if you need a brunch item or even like a late Sunday or, you know, Sunday morning something or got guests or something, Pull one of those guys out and just cut them up and microwave it really quick, or even just warm them up in the oven. Um, and you've got breakfast ready to go. We definitely yep. had quiche for dinner, though, that's for sure. We, we got them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think uh, I think our bandwidth is uh, starting to fall out here. So, okay. uh, Laura, Laura, the, the basil pesto is the Costco brand. Sure. Um, it's the same one that we've I've bought in my house, too. So, all right, so um, Jason, I think because your audio is cutting out, we're we're gonna go ahead and uh, say good night to everybody. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Thanks thank for you, joining Dave. us. Uh, thanks for the really delicious cocktails. Uh, we have some fun stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna kind of shift our schedule a little bit, but uh, we do have an alumni who did an internship over in Spain. Um, Jason, what was the name of the restaurant? Uh, it's the Cellar Cellar de Roca. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Esther Ancien is going to join us. Uh, I think we reschedule that for a couple of weeks from now. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we're going to we have some fun guest speakers coming on now that we're uh, in a good groove with our guest speakers. So well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day and good night. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.